So this is the last part of this section on mechanistic niche modeling. And, and I'm going to give you an overview of the concept of the mechanistic niche model in this lecture, and then talk about how we can integrate this kind of modeling with the sorts of correlative modeling approaches that you've mostly been focusing on in this course. And at the very end, I'll point you to some resources that you can use if you're interested in going further with mechanistic niche modeling. Now, biological processes are, of course, happening on a wide range of timescales. The process that really we're all interested in here, I think, is the species distribution. As Town said, a really simple question, and but a really important ecological question is why are species in some places and not in others? This is certainly a question that's always fascinated me. And I really want to understand why a, a given species distribution limits look like they do. And this is at a relatively large scale of space and time that the um, species distribution um, is sitting in terms of the hierarchy of um, biological processes across time and space. So it's a biogeographical question. As Town said, um, it's being driven by a whole series of populations lower down. So we have population level processes um, that are leading to the species distribution. And that can also include, in addition to population dynamics, dispersal, dispersal dynamics as well. We have all the organismal processes that we've been going through in, in this section, the ecophysiological processes. Cellular processes below that, molecular processes, and even quantum processes. And then from the physical side of things, we also have um, processes operating at different scales of space and time. So we have the microclimatic processes that are um, what the individual organism is experiencing. We have um, the weather conditions and the soil conditions that are driving those microclimatic um, conditions that are happening on a, on a greater scale of space and time. And finally, the climatic processes that are really driving the weather systems and the geological processes that are driving the soil formation and landscape formation and so on operating at even greater time scales and uh, spatial scales. And so we're faced with a big puzzle, lots of different pieces to the puzzle. And what I'm really describing here is the puzzle of the fundamental niche of the organism. Um, but then we have to add in the other piece, puzzle pieces, which are the other species in the community as well. So it's a really complex puzzle. Um, but when you are trying to do a big puzzle with lots of pieces, a good place to start is with the edge pieces. And I like to think metaphorically of this mechanistic niche modeling approach where you're homing in on thermodynamic constraints that operate always, that are always relevant and present. Um, basic requirements in terms of temperature, uh, in terms of water and nutrition. Um, these, these are the good pieces to start with, they, they, they act as the edge pieces because nothing can happen outside of those thermodynamic constraints. Everything has to obey those laws and those constraints. Now, that being said, there's still a huge range of possibilities of what might be limiting from a um, temperature, water, nutritional point of view in the way that the organism is interacting with its habitat and so on. So I think in the process of actually doing a mechanistic niche model, what you really need to start with, first of all, is a good understanding of the basic biology going on here, a good understanding of the ecology and the natural history. A sense of what's going on in the field uh, is really valuable because it helps you to hone in quickly on the limiting processes. To give a silly example, if we know that oxygen um, is, is an important requirement of, um, say, a lizard living on a, on a, in a desert, and if and we know it, it, it's some in some situations that is going to be limiting, and so starting at that point and trying to work out if oxygen is limiting is is just silly, of course, because of our understanding of um, where oxygen is limiting. It may well be really important in an aquatic environment, but so you know the, the quicker you can home in on something that's limiting, the better. Um, and you know you really you make progress in this kind of modeling approach by discovering limiting processes. It's uh, more often than not, you find that the thing you're looking at isn't actually that limiting, but um, um, it's, it's that process of discovering a limiting process. That's when you've learned something. So um, using that biological knowledge to at least um, make a first guess about where to start, where to focus for a particular kind of organism is helpful. Um, measuring um, the ecophysiological responses in the lab is the next stage. So gathering that individual trait data that's, that's required 
And the nice thing is that these models are telling you what traits you need. So there's no ambiguity about what you need to find. And the same with characterizing the microclimates. Um, these models are telling you what you need. Uh, and so while um, that helps with, you know, making it a much clearer problem, um, because of the demand for these particular variables and these particular traits, uh, it, it's harder. It really, you have to be more specific in what you use compared to say a statistical model where all you need is predictors that are um, somehow associated with the processes, but we don't need to get the actual processes. And um, finally, then you, 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 you develop that model of the, of the subsets of processes that you think are the most important. And then you compute those responses, project them to the environment and assess whether they're limiting. That's the process of doing a mechanistic niche model. So it's quite a different process to the correlative modeling process. And there's some um, different strengths and weaknesses in these two approaches. And they're definitely more or less useful for different questions. As always, you know, everything depends on the question you're trying to ask as to whether something is the appropriate approach. And um, what I want to do now, though, is have a think about the sorts of ways that these two very contrasting approaches of understanding the constraints of species ranges and thinking about their niches um, can be used together. How do we integrate these? And I've got three different ways that we could integrate them. Um, and, and, you know, sort of becoming more and more sophisticated um, with each of these different levels. So the first is simply a con conceptual integration. So for me, when I first <clears throat> learned about those um, coupled equations and started to think of an organism in that way, I found that really, really helpful to organize my thinking. Um, and, and what I'm saying here is that just understanding the, the conceptual approaches um, of mechanistic niche modeling without actually doing the approach can help you think more broadly and holistically about possible limiting factors and may guide your choice of predictive variables when you go to um, develop your mechanistic or your statistical models, <clears throat> how you might interpret the response curves. You know, and maybe, um, I mean, for me, it makes me very wary actually of interpreting response curves because when you start to see the sorts of um, indirect chains of causation that can lead to a, an association of a species with a particular environmental variable, uh, you realize that it's really, really difficult to go from the distribution, the statistical association, the shape of the response curve to something really quite subtle like um, the fact that this particular species is able to survive because it has a diapause egg and a very fast growth rate to allow it to exploit a, a, a short period of growth in the spring uh, and then lie dormant over the over the remainder of the year and, and that's the whole chain of causation that leads to the association of that species with a certain pattern of seasonality of temperature and rainfall or something like this or some really specific interaction between the soil properties and that local climate in terms of um, you know the way that the and the organisms taking up water from the soil that can end up um, as a, you know really strong statistical correlation in terms of rainfall and temperature and other typical environmental variables but um, you know, often it's a, it's a far more complex than we can we can really imagine okay so that but that's one way it's just ha having these ideas about what is actually going on at the fundamental uh, thermodynamic level in terms of individual constraints um, to try and interpret and, and understand statistical models. <clears throat> the second, which is, a, I guess, a little bit more powerful, is where you're able to develop a model that's statistical and a model that's mechanistic for the same species and make comparisons. Then that's really interesting. It, it helps you look at interpret response curves. So if you, you actually do think you've hit on a mechanism and and you do understand roughly what's going on, um, then by, by comparing the response curves and looking for congruence in the predictions, um, you can enhance that understanding and, and potentially um, make your conclusion stronger than it might have been before. So let me give you an example of this. Um, this is a zoom in, this, this image here, of the distribution prediction that um, my colleagues and I made for the greater glider. And so you saw a zoomed out version of this. This is zoomed in on the wet tropics around Cairns in um, northern Australia. 
it's an area of tropical rainforest where there's a whole lot of endemic species that live in the mountains in the tropical rainforest. And so this is the greater glider. Um, I'll just turn my pointer on again. This is the greater glider here, and this is a close relative called the lemuroid ringtail, which uh, has the distribution points in white there. And so, um, you know, there's a real concern about the effect of climate change on species living in these mountaintops. But a lot of the inferences have been made using correlative models. And as I'm sure you're well aware, I presume the issue of extrapolation has been discussed and um, there can be concern that maybe these models are extrapolating and giving us a false sense of what will happen in the future. So, but we have this, um, so this is the Mac, Maxent model for the, for the species that I showed you as well. And what we can do is take both models to the future and see if they give us a congruent prediction or not. And this is what we get. And as you can see, it's an extremely similar prediction between these two models with just a simple addition of a three degree warming is all that we've done here. And you may have heard of the late Richard Levins. Um, he said once that our truth is the intersection of independent lies. And of course, these models we're developing are not the truth, they're lies. Um, but uh, here we have one lie and here we have another lie and they're both uh, intersecting and that is really bolstering our conclusion, unfor an unfortunate conclusion for the lemur and ringtail possums about future effects of climate change on the species. And the final and perhaps most exciting uh, aspect of integrating these approaches, and to me what is really a frontier and hasn't been fully explored, is the direct integration of these approaches. So we could use mechanistic model outputs as inputs for correlative models. This has been done a little bit, um, but I think it could be explored a lot further. What we're essentially doing in, in, in this process is creating much more proximal predictor layers for the correlative models. We're translating the environmental variables through the filter of the organism's biology, its physiology and behavior, metabolism and so on, to create layers that are more targeted to that species that potentially will give us a simpler interpretation when we look at the response curves, but also really importantly, less extrapolation. Because if you're taking the sort of raw, more distal climatic conditions and other environmental conditions and translating them through the mechanistic, mechanistic model into a new layer and then making the prediction from there, when you want to project to another time or place, so to understand an invasion or past or future climate change, you recreate those proximal layers from the future environmental conditions. And in doing that, you're certainly getting around a whole lot of extrapolation. Still may be extrapolation, but you're reducing it a lot. And this could be at the level of some physiological output, like the grams of baby of the greater glider that I showed you before, but it could also be some kind of soil, some sort of microclimatic metric, um, even some, some summary of soil moisture rather than um, uh, using some combination of air temperature and rainfall that may be indirectly getting at the soil moisture if that's the driving variable it's better to make a more proximal predictor using these kinds of approaches let me just let me just give you an example of of, of such an uh, an attempt that was um actually done quite some time ago now uh, 10 years ago by jane Eliff and myself and stephen phillips where we were looking at models of the cane toad and trying to understand the spread of the cane toad around Australia and how that might change into the future. In general, trying to think a bit harder about how we tackle the problem of species whose ranges are expanding, where we're not, it's not really the case where, where we should be using a, a correlative species distribution model, but often we have to. So what sorts of things can we do to improve that? And to what extent can we integrate the mechanistic understanding to improve these predictions? So what you can see in this map, uh, point it back on, this map is a prediction using a mechanistic model um, of uh, the cane toad's potential range. And it's basically a map of the number of breeding seasons that um, a cane toad would expect, some breeding months that a cane toad would be expected to have. And it's integrating our understanding of the cane toad's body temperature through the biophysics, uh, including the way that evaporation is occurring and cooling the animal down, depending on the humidity of the environment, um, and, and there, thereby getting an idea of activity constraints and combining that with a, a model, a biophysical model of a pool of water and how long there would be for the um, cane toads to actually lay their eggs in that water, if they could be active at that time of year and then have the eggs develop. 
So that's the nature of the mechanistic model. And then we tried some statistical models. Um, so here's an example of a GAM. And Jane Elith was thinking about a few different ways that um, we could treat the data. The we have the observations of presence and absence. And so in this GAM, she's using the observed absences. And you can see the prediction of the model um, looking somewhat similar to the mechanistic model, but it is predicting in these areas in the south of Australia or along the coast as being suitable and also up in the Alpine area as well. And you can see a little bit of um, a decline in suitability in the very far north of Australia in this model. They look pretty similar. What happens if we take them to future climate 50 years from now or so? Here's what the mechanistic model does. So generally speaking, there's a bit of a contraction in the north here, presumably because of um, the water bodies drying out a bit, but the uh, warmer conditions are allowing the range to expand further south. Uh, and uh, it's reasonably dramatic in terms of this low marginal, marginal suitability area in orange. Of, it's probably one breeding month per year, but this yellow area, um, which you know, reasonably well captures the actual current extent of the range of the species um, presently, is shifting about 200 kilometres further south. So quite an expansion to the south. But here's what the GAM does when you take it to the future. Um, it really gets excited about this uh, southern area of Australia, um, which is quite an arid area, um, as being suitable. And um, the, also in the north, it's predicting a contraction away from the very north of Australia. Now, um, we're pretty sure that this is <clears throat> an extrapolation error. There aren't that many records of cane toads right up in the north of Australia at the moment. Um, not because they're not there, just because they haven't been sampled um, well in that area. So we're getting this artifact of them becoming less, uh, this area becoming less suitable. But there's also this, um, this prediction of um, high suitability down around the Nullarbor Plain is quite, quite odd and um, perplexing and likely to be wrong. Um, so then Jane tried a different approach where she used reachable absences um, with the GAM. Um, rather than any kind of absence. So weighting that reachable absences is more um, uh, influential on the model predictions. And you see that the, the prediction to the future is actually not that different, except they're sort of pulling away more from the coast in the, in the region that's um, predicted to be su suitable in the southern areas. But we're still getting this extrapolation issue in the north. <clears throat> so we tried an integration of the two different models. And first we tried simply making um, the mechanistic output as a predictor in the model. <clears throat> so what you have is in this model here is using reachable absences again, but using the mechanistic variables that came out of that um, this, this model as predictors, um, and then projecting that to the future, but you get pretty much the same thing as well. We're getting similar sorts of issues where we're getting likely an extrapolation issue up here and probably some artifactual prediction of them being doing super well in this area in the, um, in the south. But finally, what we tried doing was using the absence points from the mechanistic model um, as absences in the, in the GAM. Because really what's powerful about a mechanistic model is when it's saying the species can't be there. That's the most powerful inference that the model can make. Um, and and the other, you know, where, where it's possible, we just, we're saying, well, that those limiting factors that we've identified are not operating there, but there may be other ones that we haven't explicitly modeled. Um, so trying that and taking that, that, that gives us a GAM that actually looks a lot more, um, a lot more similar to the, to the mechanistic model under current climate and under uh, future climate, really. So this um, this is quite a promising thing where you know maybe we can't always get the full understanding of the distribution limits from a mechanistic model, but at least we can make some inferences and that can help us in identifying in a more powerful way absence points for the modeling and thereby increase the statistical model's power and reduce the issues of extrapolation to future conditions. So I hope that uh, this series of um, mini lectures has not overloaded you too much. I feel a bit tired after giving them all. Um, it, it was condensed, a very condensed summary of what mechanistic modeling is, but hopefully it's an, enough detail to give you a sense of what's going on with a mechanistic model. And I hope that I've given you a slightly different um, view of the niche, different conceptual interpretation of the niche. And what I think is 
So the interesting that you get from this way of thinking about the niche is it's not really easily definable as this volume in environmental space, really, because um, especially once you start to bring in the temporal dimension, um, it's, it's actually the niche um, depends on the sequence of environments experienced, not just the, you know, the, the static mean of the environments. And um, there are many possible sequences of environments that you could come up with that may be inside or outside the niche. So it's hard to capture that temporal sequence of environments that an organism goes through, through its ontogeny in this way, you know, in this, in this multivariate space matter. Um, and the, the power of these mechanistic models, really, these, these physical models of energy mass exchange, is that relatively simple models can be given very complex sequences of environments and tell you what would occur. So as long as the physics is, is still you know, relevant, then it will tell you what will happen. You can take exactly those equations and make a calculation for, say, the heat budget of an organism on Mars, and the physics is still the same on Mars. You put all the variables in, you'll know what temperature you know, a cane toad would be on Mars. So the, the, they're powerful in that sense, and you can throw complex sequences of um, environmental conditions at these models, these mechanistic models. And while you, there's, so, there's an infinite number, effectively, of, of sequences of environments you could throw at it, um, where it's powerful is where it says that is not an appropriate sequence. So it really is in that sort of falsification, Popperian falsif falsification um, paradigm that these models are operating well. They're really powerful when they say, no, this is not possible. And it's actually really interesting if the model says this is not possible and you find the organism in that location because then you're going to learn something that you didn't know uh, about what tricks that organism has or what errors you've got in your code or whatever um, for why the organism didn't occur there. Um, okay, so to finish up, I just want to point you to this website that I've made for the um, package, the R package that um, I've developed in collaboration with Warren Porter, basically taking Warren's life work. And as I mentioned earlier, adding some bells and whistles on, onto that, I've integrated the dynamic energy budget theory in um, and various other things, and then made them uh, an R package with lots of details of help and so on, and it's all completely open source. And this website acts as a guide to the package to get you started. Um, <clears throat> so it includes all the vignettes that are in the package. You can just go to the um, to the help part of the website and directly have a look at those vignettes um, that give some of the theory or and show examples of how to run the models. Um, and there's also links to um, other resources that relate to mechanistic niche modeling. So there are a set of microclimatic gridded environmental data sets uh, that are available, um, one for Australia, one for the USA. These are historical um, grids that are hourly historical of microclimate, and there's a monthly long-term average microclimate grid for the globe as well. And there's a link here to Ilya McLean's microclimate modeling website. He's been doing a whole lot of microclimate modeling um, work and has developed a package of his own as well uh, for microclimate modeling. And um, then if, you, if you're interested in the dynamic energy budget theory, there are links to um, the, the DEB uh, information on the web there. And um, Actually, I haven't said anything about plants really in, in, these, in, in this section, but um, I've put Raphael uh, Schouten there. He was a, a past student of mine who has um, developed a dynamic energy budget model um, for plants, or at least he took an existing um, dynamic energy budget model for plants and applied it so that you can actually use it. Uh, he's done it in the Julia language and he's integrated it with microclimate um, conditions. So it's really fascinating having an animal perspective and then thinking about the ontogeny of a plant, which is what this model can do, and understanding how the trajectory of that plant's growth in terms of how quickly it's getting its roots down into the soil and growing up vertically affects its ability to get moisture out of the soil and, and how, how warm it's getting as it grows up above the, um, the surface of the ground. The, the microclimatic integration with this whole life cycle model of a plant going from a seed through its gauntlet of trying to um, uh, germinate and, and get to a, a size that's sort of got its roots in the water table and so on is really interesting. So that's really also, that's a frontier of mechanistic niche modeling, um, doing this kind of modeling with plants. 
And so I put those links there. And also there are other people doing this kind of modeling. Um, and one of those people is Lauren Buckley and she's got a website called The Trench Project, which, which has also got a lot of resources for mechanistic heat modeling. Um, and so that's it from me. And um, I'm hopefully going to turn up to the question and answer session. So um, I might see you there. And thanks town for the opportunity to, to talk in this really, really amazing course.